Welcome back to another episode of the Randy Wilson Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Wilson. This is episode 141, and today we are super excited to have the CEO and president of VPM, that's Virginia Public Media, uh, Jamie Swain with us today. But before we get into our conversation, we want to thank all of those who are listening and following the show. Uh, We see the traffic picking up. you have really been engaged with this Michelle Mosby interview, who's a candidate for mayor. And so, again, thank you for continuing to stay subscribed to our show. You can follow the show everywhere podcasts are played. And you can go over to YouTube and see Miss Swain. I know you want to see her. Also, go check out RandyWilsonPodcast.com. Super excited today. My mom's even visiting from North Carolina, which is rare that this happens. So I'm going to be on my best behavior. Very good. I'm going to be on my best behavior because typically we act up a little bit. All right. But But your uh, mom's watching. My mom's watching. So, Miss Swain, it's a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, uh, the story. Look, I was, uh, we went to the, um, I was at the state of the city. um, And that's the, that's when the mayor kind of comes out and talks about the budget for the the new year. And uh it's kind of a big, it's kind of an important place to go. And I just happened to be sitting down and have an empty seat and had a pretty important person sit beside me. And that's how I became acquainted with Miss Swaim. And so uh, thank you so much. Thank it was you. really appreciative. Yeah, it was a fortuitous meeting. You had the empty chair and then we got chatting. So yeah. it's great that we were finally able to schedule this and, and, and talk about what's going on with VPM. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be an easy conversation yeah. because before we even set up, we started just rolling. Mm-hmm. So I think this conversation <laughs> is going to flow. Um, for the, I don't know, for those of you who've been hiding under a rock, okay, <laughs> you you may or may not know, but VPM is broke ground yesterday, if I'm correct. Correct. Uh, today is August 13th. August 12th, you guys broke ground mm-hmm. and uh, the development building process of your new building, which is what, 54,000 square feet, five yeah, well, floors? Yep, exactly. Uh, I mean, this You've is done exciting. your homework. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. This, yeah. this, is, this is exciting for uh, not only Richmond, but it's exciting for the state of Virginia because you guys cover a very broad area. Right. If I understand correctly, you cover, you do it's television and radio. Correct. Um, Central Virginia, Shenandoah Valley. Um Two million potential two listeners. Million, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but what I'm really excited about is that it's it's going to be pretty much right in the heart of Richmond. Right. Um, why Richmond? Why did you guys choose Richmond? And just talk to me a little bit about um, what we're getting ready to experience here. Good. Well, it's a great question and it's an important moment in our mm-hmm. transformation as VPM. So our current facility, we in Chesterfield, mm-hmm. great address, 23 Sesame Street. I mean, you can't beat the address, <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. but we've been there since 1964, if you can imagine. Actually, our 60th birthday is in about a month from today. Wow. And when you think about that, think about how much change has happened, particularly, and you know, in the media space. In 1964, there's no way we could have contemplated augmented reality, uh, virtual reality, generative AI, podcasting, social media, none of those things. And so we needed to really think about a facility that can enable us to serve our mission, which is to tell and distribute stories about Virginia and the things that Virginians matter, that matter most to Virginians. But in addition to that, when we moved into Chesterfield in 1964, it was fields as far as the eye can see. Now we're surrounded and we're hemmed in by apartments and and retail businesses. And the challenge is, as public media, we're not very public. And so we took a long, hard look at, is now the right time to move? And I get a lot of credit to our board who took a really bold vision and said, yeah, let's move. So if you can believe it, I looked at 70 locations. And I looked everywhere from uh, Chesterfield, Hanover, Henrico to Richmond. And I'm not from here. So I didn't have any sort of baggage about locations and truly looked at each. And when I stood on that spot, Randy, it's like, when you know it, you know it. Mm -hmm. We are a news organization. We've tripled the size of the newsroom since I got there. And that spot is just down the street from the seat of power, which I think is important for our community. We are- down the street from where? The seat of power. When you think about city hall and the government, governor, who is here locally, and we should talk about local Mm -hmm. news, but who's here to keep an eye and hold truth to power? We are, and to be six blocks away, I think Mm -hmm. is important. We are an art and culture institution. You may know that we bought Style Weekly a few years ago. We're producing more art and culture programming, podcasting, and we're there in the heart of the arts and culture district in historic Monroe Ward. We're focused on early childhood education and education writ large. So being able to bring people and bring children in, and you can truly put the public in public media. We are going to be right there, as you said, on Broad Street, glass front, 
opening our doors, bringing people in. And that's what we want. We want that engagement. It's not just our facility. It's truly a facility for the public. As you said, we represent so much of Virginia. We're going to be next to and around other Virginia institutions. And so I couldn't imagine a place that better reflected who we are as VPM than that spot. I mean, just to look at the visual, it looks really nice. Mm -hmm. It looks like, um, I feel like it you know, for Richmond to be a mid-sized city, it, it really gives Richmond a, a big city feel. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if, if you've traveled and you've been to big cities like New York and right. Chicago and you walk down the street, when you walk by the news network, so you know it. Right. Because it, it it gives off the appeal. You can tell. And that's kind of the impression that I got when I saw the visual of what it's going to look like. And it's exciting that you're you're doing something that you know, that encompasses the city because people are quick sometimes to talk about when, you know, I mean, gentrification is a real thing. Sure. It's happening. Yeah. And you guys appear to be creating something uh, in the Monroe district, if I understand correctly, right? right? That's in, that's allowing the community to be a part of it. And so I yeah. take my hat off to you guys for that because it's not just like, hey, we're, and you're nonprofit. Right. You know, so it's right. like I'm, I'm looking at all the optics in regard to how people, how will the community perceive this? But it looks like the, the, how you uh, did your opening, your mm-hmm. launch, your introduction was right. very, I, I thought that that was really cool because you basically read everything about you. You humbled yourself and welcomed the city in. Mm-hmm. And it was a very uh, empathetic way to kind of embrace letting people see, you know. We want you to be a part of this. So, Well, thank you for seeing that. I want to give all credit to SMBW, who's our architect and design firm. And when they really studied that block, we asked them, as you said, we want to enter this community with humility. Mm-hmm. There's amazing history. Those buildings next to us are 1926. Gorgeous buildings. The architecture actually was very forward thinking of that time. So SMBW, which is a local firm, went to the other museums. They went to Black History Museum, um, Virginia Museum of History and Culture to look at the history so that we could nod to that history, but also bring it forward and give that contemporary look that you're talking Mm -hmm. about. I love that it does that nodding. So we don't have brick and we don't have some of the same exact uh, materials, but the colors harken back to that. Mm -hmm. So it brings that together. And then the glass for me is important. It's about transparency. It's about inviting the community in. When that street, when that building, it was... uh, Cohen Family Department Store from, let's see, if I remember my history, 1886 to about 1986. Well, imagine for many Black citizens, you couldn't even cross the street at that point. So how can we make something that's inclusive and welcoming for everybody? And as you said, we have to enter that community with humility. Some of those businesses, and hats off to them, they have been there through thick and thin, through COVID, all of these things. And while other people are living, those businesses, whether you're Wallers and Jewelers, Bunkies Trophies, Shea Fushi, Hawks Drawer, those guys have stayed there and they're committed to the city and we're committed to them. And yes, those guys have been there before us. And you said gentrification. Mm -hmm. Something we worry about is we don't want people to leave. We want to be a place that brings people back to those businesses. Broad Street used to be thriving. How do we get Broad Street to thrive once again and be that corridor? It is our downtown. It is our focal point for not just the city of Richmond, but for visitors who come in. Think about our legislators who come in once a year. Think about guests who come to the Altria or come to the library. These are major Virginia institutions. But we want, I want them to go to those other businesses. And there's such exciting things happening in Richmond. We feel a part of that. And we want to be, you know, I joked, Mr. Rogers says, be a good neighbor. We want to, <laughs> we truly believe that. We yeah. want to be a good neighbor. One of the things we're trying to do is not just move into the community, but also tell the stories as a storyteller. So we are interviewing some of the people on the block to talk about That's the history. Cool. Like, think about the history of Wallers. Yeah. This is like the longest black owned business in Richmond. And they have an amazing story and an amazing family. Yeah. And if we can bring some light to that and so help support them, then all the better. Yeah, that's cool. I, I, I see and believe that you guys will do that. I, I think that your social media over the years has kind of t- taken that same approach and uh, super excited. So kudos to you guys Thank for what you. you're doing. Um, it's, a, it's a remarkable thing. Talk to me a little bit about the retail store. I'm not, that's, is, there's a, is there a retail piece to VPM? Because I'm not familiar with that. There, so. so here's the way it worked. When, mm-hmm. we, when we bought the lot, so for folks who don't know that are listening, it's, betwe- it's right on Broad Street between First and Fushi. Mm-hmm. But there, we're the middle of the block. So we go from Broad to Grace. Mm-hmm. So as you said, we're building a five-story, 53,000 square foot building in the front. And what we did is we stepped back the fourth and fifth floor so that we don't dwarf the buildings next to us, which are 
were mostly three story. Okay. Because that Cohen family department store I mentioned actually burnt down. Uh, and they what they did is they sort of crashed it down and built a parking lot over okay. it. So as we come in, we're building in the front. In the back, because the city doesn't want to just see the backs of buildings or the back of parking structures, because we're going to have a parking structure in between, they ask that you build something on that Gray Street side. So it's a 1,500 square foot building. I think when we figured out the program, we decided, you know what, I don't know that we need that space at the beginning. It's a great expansion opportunity for us. But we're also thinking about how do we prudently manage this. You mentioned we are a nonprofit. So not only do we have to manage the cost of the building itself, but also ongoing operating costs. We're paying our property taxes, just like other citizens of Richmond. We're not getting a break on that as a nonprofit, but we believe that's important. We want to give back. We want to invest in the schools. And so we also need to figure out a way, well, how can we responsibly steward some of these costs? So what we're going to do is potentially we're looking at leasing that out and what it'll be. I don't know. My team who's listening, they all want this coffee shop hybrid music slash, I think some wine at night. So we'll see. We'll figure that out. I mean, this Richmond, Richmond is so foodie and I get it, but I, sometimes, yeah. I mean, I'm sometimes I'm just wondering, can we, are we not going to have enough coffee shops? I mean, yeah, they, I know we may, <laughs> might have too many, but they probably just want wine, but we'll yeah. figure out something that act. I think that the, something with, with this, live and engagement music, that's what that would the be city cool. wants. The city yeah. wants something very active. Yeah. So how can we do that? And then in between those two buildings, we will build parking. Cause Randy, the one thing I learned about this city, yeah. nobody can parallel park. Yeah, <laughs> I've learned true. that like, come on. <laughs> and then uh, parking is a big issue, especially mm-hmm. for those businesses that are downtown. Yeah. So what we've decided to do, and this is not cheap, but we think it's important for the community. We're going to build a parking structure that'll have some isolated parking for staff, but parking for the community. So if you're going to a business, if you're having dinner at Shea Fushi or down at Pearly's, you'll have a place to park. Got it. The other thing is we really want events. We want to bring people in. So on Broad Street, we have a glass front studio slash community space. So you can record in there. You could do different things. Imagine you could do a live podcast Mm -hmm. like this in there with about a studio audience of 100 or 150. Oh, cool. But we want to bring people in and where are they going to park? Because then if those people come downtown, they might go patron some of the businesses. They might walk around. How do we create that energy downtown mm-hmm. that, again, people have been trying to do for years. We're no, we're the newbies on the block. And yeah. We're not saying that this hasn't been done before. We're just hoping to be helpful yeah. and bring our own sort of secret sauce of what VPM can bring to but it. Being a nonprofit, it seems to me that it, it gives you a little bit more autonomy and in being innovative. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, you, you're the new people on the block and you're not trying to say, I mean, yeah, you're close to being the only people on the block. News Flash, Richmond's Time Dispatch is, is leaving their location. Right. So, I mean, that's it's only more opportunity to, I think to me, being a nonprofit just gives you the flexibility to try things and take risk. And right. So that's that's interesting. But that explains to me, that helps me understand, because I didn't understand that retail part right. or what that meant. Um, I think there's a lot of people out there that are not super familiar with all the things that VPM offers. You you shared a little bit just now. So can you go into a little bit more detail? It's sure. not just TV and radio. Right. There's there's programming. There's, I mean, outside of programming for this type of stuff. I mean, you actually right. do things to help the community and get back. And that's such a good question because I think so many people come to us through PBS mm-hmm. or through NPR. Mm-hmm. And I think for so long, that's what we were. We were a PBS and NPR station. But what we're trying to do is double down on local because who is left to tell many of those local stories? You're doing it a lot. You know, there are mm-hmm. other individuals who are doing it. We're also trying to enter that space. Mm-hmm. So I think from news, a news perspective, and we've always had journalists, we've always had news because of being that NPR affiliate. But when you look at news around the region, you mentioned the Richmond Times-Dispatch, many of the newspapers are under pressure because the business model is changing. Once Google and Facebook took the classifieds away, mm-hmm. that model started to be very challenged. And when you look at communities around the country that have news deserts, they have low voter turnout, they have less civic engagement because there is no one to hold truth to power. And people get polarized because they go to these national news sources. So we decided early on when I arrived, and I come from a news background, that this is the thing that just is a passion of mine. How can we ensure that people have the trusted factual information they need when our citizens go to the voting booth, for example, later this year? Mm -hmm. It's not about opinion. It's about us 
arming people with different facts and information. So we've added journalists, we've added editors, we've added photo journalists to try to get out there and cover the stories. And again, the people, the issues, what matters most Mm -hmm. to people here in Richmond. So that's a big piece of it. And as you said, it's not just broadcast and television. Obviously, those actually are dying. The, The audience numbers for broadcast, television and radio are slowly declining. Because how do people get their content? Like this, it's Mm -hmm. on demand. Mm -hmm. They get it online. They get it on mobile. They get it on Instagram or YouTube. So we're really trying to turn, and you mentioned the word innovation. I don't think people often think of public media as innovative, but we are truly trying to innovate. We've launched podcasts. We have the Podcast Lab at the ICA, which is a partnership Mm -hmm. to bring more podcasting to Richmond for us to incubate some of our own ideas. As you said, we're on social media. I don't know if people know. We're on TikTok. We're giving it a try. Mm -hmm. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. We're all of these different platforms trying to tell those stories in different ways. I mean, Style Weekly is a really good example. So Style Weekly... We talked about the challenges in the news industry. So they were part of the Tribune Media Company empire. Well, that was bought by Lee, or sorry, it was actually bought by a hedge fund called Alden Global Capital. So Alden Global Capital is a hedge fund going around the world, going around the country, buying up newspapers, squeezing them for revenue, and then just decimating them, which is leaving so many of these news deserts around the country. Well, they did that to Tribune. So one of the things that cut was style. And I'll tell you, Randy, we heard about it at like a Thursday morning, and we were on the phone with Tribune that night to see, could you put us in touch with the people at Alden? We are so interested in this brand. It has been an iconic resource and brand for this community. But obviously, printing that paper every week is challenging. The business model isn't there. So we were able to get that. We were able to get uh, Brent Baldwin, an amazing editor at Style Mm -hmm. Weekly, Scott Elmquist, who I say is one of the best Mm -hmm. photographers Mm -hmm. here in the region. And they they took a leap of faith and came with us, came to the v, to, came to VPM. We just hired a general manager, Macaulay Hammond, and we're trying to rent reinvent style with all the great values and everything that it's brought to this community, but make it more digital first. Mm-hmm. So now we publish it four times a year, but now it's events, it's digital, it's e newsletters, it's all these kinds of other things. The way people get their information. As far as publish content. it, you publish hard copy, publish or so. Yeah. So digital. what we're doing? So it's actually it's <clears throat> doubled in size. I Mm -hmm. should have brought you one. Doubled in size. So if you go to styleweekly.com, you can even subscribe to get them. But it's a nicer paper. And so it's a little bit more, hey, when you're sitting at home, it's on your coffee table. So we just had Best Fest. These are the what Richmonders vote on what's best. And we're hosting a Best Fest event here in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And we will showcase the artists. We'll showcase the food and the drinks and all of that. It'll be a great community Mm -hmm. event. But what we did is take that published weekly that we gave away for free. So again, that business model was tough when we looked at it, but try to say, okay, how can we still have a print product that's meaningful that people want to go get? And in fact, it's kind of a cool thing now where people go, Oh, one of them's out. I want to go find it. It's a little bit of the Easter egg, like how to get to find it. But meanwhile, in between, how are young people getting stuff? They're on their phones. They want to check it out. We've thought about incubating maybe a style podcast. We've played around with that idea. How do you bring that arts and culture, but in a way and reach, people where they are. We're not arrogant enough to think, oh, you turn on the TV anymore. Not that many people do it. And we need to get younger. We need to diversify our audience if we want to be successful going how, forward. How, how many employees do you have at BPM? We're about 100 employees. That's all? We're doing a lot, Randy. <laughs> so, that's my, so <laughs> my like, team's right now going, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so <laughs> um, tired. With, with all these ideas and things that you guys yep. got going on, uh, like who's the think tank? What, what does that consist of? Is How involved is the board? Like you just shared a lot of things there. And I'm like, 100 employees? I yeah. mean, I can imagine you got editors, you got producers, you got journalists, you right. know, but like on your day to day like who's the who's the what's the leadership look like that that, that you work directly with cuz i'm assuming that that's where a lot of this comes from it is and it isn't. I think one of the great things, the, the way I think about our organization is that ideas come from everywhere. They're certainly not going to come. I have an executive and a senior team. That is not going to necessarily come from that group of people sitting in a room. Where it comes from is those hundred people. And mm-hmm. what we try to do is create a space that everyone has the opportunity to try some stuff, put forward an idea. It's also mixing the organization. Back in the old days, you'd have the TV people, then you'd have the radio people, then you'd have the digital people. And 
and never the, the group shall meet. Now you got to mix all the groups mm-hmm. up and you've got to bring community engagement in. One of the things that we really try to do, you talk about ideas, come from the community. We have a new pitch process, for example. It used to be somebody could write a board member or, you know, and then they'd get an idea and they would percolate in. We wanted to make it very equitable and we wanted to make it the, so that any idea, so you didn't have to be polished Randy coming in with a super podcast. You could literally be anybody. Thank you, by the way. I, I know. You, well, you have a polished <laughs> podcast, right? You're a, you're a creator, but somebody may have this brilliant genius idea, but they don't even know how to put a pitch together. Mm-hmm. It is a simple online form. We wow. open up this portal a few times a year. Then we have a cross functional group at VPM that weigh in on it. And I don't look, I mean, I'm busy building buildings and trying mm-hmm. to raise money, but we have amazing creative people and we have this amazing community that's full of ideas. And a lot of it is how do you have that two way street? That's what public media is. We have a tool called Harken where we go and listen to the community about what they want. And in fact, our journalists cur- figure out, curate their um, content around the general assembly based on what they hear on the Harken platform. Hey, what are you guys interested in? What matters to you? We're doing some research right now about unmet needs in the community. So we want that two-way street because the ideas are not going to come by the cabal at the top and the white smoke comes out. Mm-hmm. They ha- it has to be democratic. That's where the best stuff comes from. Cool. That's cool. Um, uh, man, it slipped my mind. You got me thinking about a lot of things here. <laughs> yeah. Um, There's a lot to tease out. Yeah. It's been a busy, I've been there for five years. It's certainly been a busy five years. Where did you come from? So right before this, I was at PBS headquarters. So I was at the, I joke, the mothership mm-hmm. where I started in digital and then I ended up running strategy and operations and sort of a, a sharp left turn in my career. But there was a point there where I thought, it's great to be at that national level, but I truly wanted to be local. But this was the only community I wanted to come to. So I had to wait till one day the job opened up. Where are you originally from? The Jersey Shore. But I really? went to the University of Virginia. And then once you go, once you're in Central Virginia, it mm-hmm. kind of, it gets to you, right? So you're you, a Wahoo, is that right? I'm is a Wahoo. What? Yeah, yeah Wahoo Wah. Yeah, okay. I know what <laughs> I was going to ask you. You guys have, uh, you, you've been celebrated with, with Emmys. And mm-hmm. you, you talk to me a little bit about, I'm not familiar, but I, I I see on, I got, you know, Elijah is a friend of mine. And yeah. uh, I know that he's won a couple in, Emmys. And yeah. so, yeah. Uh, you know, it's okay. Let, let them know. Brag, or brag on yourself a bit. You've had some accomplishments here. I love that. I love that because I don't think as public media, we're so good at bragging about ourselves, mm-hmm. but I do want to brag on the team. We talk about impact because the question is our business model is not as much about eyeballs. It's about impact. And one of the ways you look at impact is recognition, especially from your peers. Mm -hmm. I think one of the ones I'm most proud of is the Murrow Awards. That is the highest level of standard of journalism. And our team has been able to get a number of different Murrow, regional Murrow. Murrow. Yeah. After Edward R. Murrow, the great journalist. Mm -hmm. And those set a high, high bar of excellence in journalism. And to me, when you get one of those awards, that's really saying something. We've gotten national awards recognized by public media, uh, the Public Media Journalists Association. Our reporter, Kairos Manzanares, was just recognized with a National Hispanic Award. Uh, in fact, I got a note from Angie Miles this morning that I just quickly read. The National Association of Black Journalists just gave Focal Point an award on one of the episodes that they did. So local, national, tellies, Emmys. It's been really incredible because it's been also across all of the genres. So certainly our news team has been recognized, but Telly Awards for shows like Unwind, Virginia Homegrown, Life in the Heartland, our podcast Admissible, which we should talk about. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but won a National Signal Award. Wow. Incredible podcast. Are you familiar with Admissible? No. So Admissible is a podcast. Uh, Ellen Horn is the producer. She came with the idea. So in Richmond, there was a serologist in the Virginia Crime Lab in the 70s and 80s. Her name was Mary Jane Burton. And in the, I think it was in the 90s, other cases started to come up and people said, oh, this was an amazing woman. She hung on to the DNA from these cases. Well, turns out, yes, and she might have been great because she hung on to that, but turned out she may not have been as uh, angelic as it seemed and maybe had uh, done some, I won't give it away. People should listen to Admissible, but maybe had done some things that actually were really damaging and impacted those cases. So the Virginia commission of whatever it is, is actually going back and looking, opening up four 
1,500 cases just on this podcast alone. And there was an exoneration recently, a man whose name was cleared, not because just because of the podcast, but because of work. So many people who are going in and helping incarcerated individuals who've been wrongly convicted, but admissible help really shine a light mm. on, hey, go you should go now. back and look. You should go check look it out at now. this. Admissible. Mm-hmm. Make sure you guys go check that out. Admissible shreds of evidence and won a national award and just incredible impact from that alone. Wow. I know. So with you, 100 folks, you're different than traditional media in a mm-hmm. lot of ways, particularly like the regular news stations and things like that. Like, do you guys, what kind of approach do you take to recruiting? Like, I, I just assume with it being a nonprofit that it's not traditional. Like, particularly in how you mm-hmm. c- c- receive information in regard to how you like, create your storylines and things that you want to do. Do you take people, you obviously take the credentialed professional folks. Sure. But do you take people who are like grassroots? Like how can a person become an employee and work at BPM? Well, we post everything. Because I feel like that's going to, I feel like people are going to grow in interest now Mm -hmm. because you're going to be on front street. Yeah. Okay. You're going to be, you you pretty much can see right through the glass. Right. That's right. You know, there's going to be a lot of creators and people Mm -hmm. hanging out there, drinking coffee, drinking wine, shooting their podcast. People are going to try to figure out like, how can I possibly launch my career? You're right. And I love that question because one of the intangibles about moving downtown Mm -hmm. is how do we attract the best and brightest, particularly as our organization changes to be digital, all of these skill sets that are new. Mm -hmm. When we build our studios, we're going high augmented reality. We need graphics people. Think about generative AI. We need people who have different skill sets. We publicly post all of our jobs. We want a very diverse uh staff because we want to reflect the communities that Mm -hmm. we serve. Certainly as we've gone through time, we've needed different types of skill sets, but our HR team does a wonderful job recruiting. We work with all the local universities. I always say, if you want to get a job at a VPM, intern, intern, intern. I'm a big believer in internships. Mm -hmm. I had a number of internships when I was coming up in the business. I learned a lot, got a lot of experience and met a lot of people. So we get interns from all over the state. Mm -hmm. Great way to come in and meet and learn and actually try some different things. We've had interns come in, they'll try one thing and they go, oh, I don't like this, but this marketing group over here, that could could be cool. So it is definitely being more present, being accessible, trying to have that cool factor. And hopefully we will, but we do. Yeah, it's, it's definitely fair game when we open up our, um, open up job descriptions and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We want everybody to apply. And we're not always looking, Randy, for the person who maybe has, uh, all of the exact skills, because those soft skills matter too. Yeah. Are you innovative? Are you willing to try some things? Are you willing to make different items and, and be willing to fail? Yeah. Right? And then try again. Yeah. It's those it's those things that make an organization great. Yeah. You uh I'm, I'm we're curious to learn a little bit more about your story and I want to get into that, but I think with you guys having a hundred employees creating such a big, massive project here. People want to know, where the money coming from? Yeah, <laughs> good <laughs> like, question. Because you guys, you know, I've been involved with nonprofits. This mm-hmm. don't appear to be a situation where you guys ran out on a capital campaign, raised all the money and said, okay, now we're ready to start. You're, right. you're still having to raise money. This isn't Absolutely. fully paid for. Well, so let me, it's a great question because mm-hmm. let me explain. A lot of the catalyst to our transformation started in 2017. Mm-hmm. We have what's called, obviously, broadcast spectrum, television spectrum. And in 20, a little before that, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, said for one time only, broadcasters can sell broadcast television spectrum that they do not want because they wanted to open up a band for the wireless providers as 5G was coming. We, WCVE, as you knew it here in Richmond Community Idea Station, happened to have spectrum in Northern Virginia, which was very lucrative. At the same time, the station in Harrisonburg, the PB PBS station. So you mentioned earlier, we're dual. So we're NPR and PBS. Mm-hmm. So they're the PBS station in Harrisonburg also had some Spectrum in Front Royal, again, very lucrative. Together, those stations sold uh, the Spectrum. We created a merger at that point, and that started a bunch of things. But what happened is we got about $180 million out of that. Mm-hmm. That's what's allowed us to do what we're able to do. So from that, we created the Virginia Foundation for Public Media. Mm-hmm. And to give You're the you, president of that also. I am the correct, president right. of that also. That, that, so those are separate Companies. They are, but the foundation, those assets are the way that they're structured is to support the mission of VPM. So while there are two separate boards, 
The foundation board is nine members, five of whom are also on the VPM board. And what that does is keeps us tethered together Mm -hmm. and supporting the mission of VPM. But the foundation was smart. What they said is, these are dollars to invest in transformation. These are dollars to invest in moving this organization forward. VPM, you still need to pay for your operations. So we're not off the hook for raising money. We very prudently manage the foundation resources, we're able to draw a certain percentage every year to support our operations. But then we raise money. So we have, and public media has had this for years since we began in 1964, a model around community support, which is essential, absolutely essential to everything we do. Everything from the one $5 up to the 10000 and even bigger dollars. So for this particular project downtown, the foundation is going to help and backstop a lot of that because they can borrow because they have such strong assets, but we are also in a capital campaign. And that's important because people will say, why do you need money if you have this other money? Well, actually, I'll give you a couple of reasons. One, importantly, it's a community asset, this building. We want the community's engagement and involvement because we truly see this as a partnership. The other piece is we don't want to drain that corpus. That foundation is supporting the content, the news that I talked about, our ability to get out and do some of these new podcasts, try some things. So we certainly don't want the building project to drain that at the expense of content. We have to do two things at once. So again, having the community support and continuing our annual giving and all of that is incredibly important so we can still deliver on our strategic plan and all of the local content and build this building at the same time. And we want to do so prudently. I never want to leave the next leadership team with an empty bank account, right? Yeah. You want you want to be operating from a position of strength. And yeah. that's what I'm trying to leave for the next yeah. leadership. But, but you're, you're not, no time soon. You're, you're not leaving anytime soon. Oh, no, soon. I'm, not, I'm busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you always want to... But I think ahead. I think it's responsible yeah, you to want, think you ahead. Want to have an orga- you want to always leave an organization better than That's right, you then walked you found into it. it. And, and yeah. you definitely are. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> you definitely are. It's been a team effort. And you mentioned the board. I mean, the board brought me in and the board said, we want transformation. We want to create a public media here that Virginia deserves. Yeah. And it's more than just being PBS and NPR. It's about being local and covering the issues, the arts, all of the things, and not just the things that, you know, news can somewhat still be create friction, yeah. but where are those places where we convene as public anymore? Yeah. When you look at trust in institutions, it's down, whether it's religion, other places that used to bring people together. So I truly believe we can do that. We have a trusted brand and I can't wait to open the doors and have moments like this, a live mm-hmm. podcast. Let's talk yeah. about, let people sort of talk to each other about that, create yeah. community, create that convening that I think we're missing. And that's a huge piece of it too. Do you feel, I, I think you're going to say yes to some degree, but you're different because you're different. Are you in competition with any local television networks? I don't think, I mean, do you consider it a competition like CBS, not NBC? Really. No, you know what? I think a lot of our partners, for example, mm-hmm. we're hosting a mayoral forum coming up on October 1st. Hopefully I got the date right. Mm-hmm. And we're doing that in partnership with 12 on your side. Mm-hmm. We do work with many of the other news organizations. I mean, more news and information is good for our community. Yeah. We try to work together when we can. We have partnerships where maybe we'll share journalists and do a piece. Um, again, I think people are going to get news how they get news. Yeah. And we we also cover things a little bit differently. For example, VPN, we don't do crime. That's just not in our wheelhouse. We don't think it's something that we need to cover. Yeah. We would rather do, we do the General Assembly coverage, which I think other people are a little bit more challenged with the number of reporters. We put a lot of reporters at that, okay. again, because it provides information for all of Virginia. But if you look at Henrico and Chesterfield, they've had their local papers go away. So we're trying to step in those spaces. So yeah. we're trying to step in also where maybe there are voids that we think we can uniquely fill. When you speak of the Shenandoah Valley, yep. I'm familiar. I mean, I have a timeshare in the Shenandoah. Oh, do you? Yeah. yeah. But like, what is, what's, what's that audience like in comparison to this Richmond market? They're all different. So when you look at our DMAs as people define markets, so there's the Richmond, greater Richmond region, there's Charlottesville, and mm-hmm. then there's the Shenandoah Valley, Harrisonburg really mm-hmm. being the anchor. They're all very different when you spend time in 
them. And I'm lucky that I get to spend time in all of them. Certainly Charlottesville anchored by UVA, a lot mm-hmm. of issues on town and gown. You look at Albemarle County, how it's growing. When you get out to Shenandoah, it's somewhat similar, right? You have JMU, yeah. which is growing in prominence, but takes up a lot of space in Harrisonburg. But there's yeah. a lot of rural challenges and issues. Yeah. When I first got to VPM, we did an audience study so we could better understand the people that we serve. We have these rural, or sorry, these urban populations, but we also have a lot of rural. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we did was we started a new series called Life in the Heartland because what we heard from the community, again, this is let's listen. What are people looking for? There was a lot of content, but it's very pejorative about rural audiences. People are poor, poor white folk. Nothing's going on. In fact, it's very diverse. I don't know if you know this, but 51 some languages are spoken at the Harrisonburg High School. It is an extremely diverse and because- 51 languages? Yes. You know why? Because there's a lot of resettled communities there that come in. There's a lot of Mennonite presence in the Shenandoah Valley. Wow. And it's incredibly diverse and people don't know it. I wouldn't think of 51 languages being in here. I know, anywhere, right? I mean, because- well, It's I mean, incredible. I, I work in counseling. We, we're constantly having to find people who speak multiple languages right. and it's extremely challenging. And to, to do that. So that's... Right. It's incredibly important. Yeah. And there's a lot of... In, so it's stunning to know the makeup of the communities. They're much more diverse than I think people realize. The other thing is there are really innovative things happening in rural communities. So Life in the Heartland is shining a light on solutions that people are creating communities to deal with their own unique challenges. Broadband, for example, was mm-hmm. our first episode. How are communities who who are way out in the middle of nowhere getting broadband. And there's just really innovative ways. Farmland, transfer of farmland. Young people don't want to farm. Well, how are they thinking about that? How are they thinking about food insecurity, growing food? Just really interesting. And so I think that's been a great program. We found a producer in the Shenandoah Valley from the Shenandoah Valley because it's authentic. Yeah. Because nobody wants to say, oh, the Richmond producer came and told our story. We want people to tell their stories and people, it will be much more authentic if we can find those folks. I want to learn a little bit about you here as we, we, we're wrapping toward the fourth quarter. Tell tell us, you came from news. Yeah. You have a, you have the voice. I have the voice. Yeah. Yeah. You you sound like, you you know, (laughs) (laughs) tell tell, what did you do in uh, your previous roles in in the news? Like, tell me where where else you worked. Sure. Well, I love that you use the fourth quarter analogy because I did work in sports for a little bit. Okay. So after UVA, I went to work at CNN. So I've done, I joke, two tours at CNN. In Atlanta? I uh, I did Atlanta and DC. I was a live producer um, in, in DC and a producer in Atlanta. But in Atlanta at the time, so this is the late 90s, and CNN CNN SI started. Mm -hmm. And I've always been a sports junkie. The reason I picked UVA is I wanted to go to school with sports. I've always been a swimmer, and I'm a triathlete. So sports is my... Sports is my thing. I I bike ride. Do you bike? All right. I just did a triathlon. You should come out with me next year. I I don't... I I swim. (laughs) Your mom's mom's looking skeptical. (laughs) She she, 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 she hates it. I'm I'm on a bike too much. I'm on a bike almost to my detriment right now. It's a good good exercise, but you got to be careful out there. The problem... I ride... I deal with prostatitis a little bit. Okay. So it's just the constant... It's the constant... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But my swimming... I swim. Do you swim? All right. But I'm not the... I'm down yeah. and I'm back and I'm down <laughs> and I'm back. Yeah. You know, so but my, I, I bike with triathletes though. All right. So you ride in the... I don't get all... No, because I'm a swimmer. So what happens to me in the triathlon is I'll go out and be first out. Okay. And then so I get you, out and ride my bike. And, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm chill. Okay. I'm chill on the okay. bike and on the run you know, you, or, or the jog. The Capitol Trail? You ride it? Yeah, I love the Capitol Trail. We have too. to do that sometime. Yeah, okay. you, ever, you do the whole thing? Uh, no, but we could try that. <laughs> you know, I, I've done, I've done this, it's easy. You're much more of a biker than I am. I'm much more of a biker. And running yeah. is, I used to play basketball, so my knees left me with that. That's why sure. I had to make the transition. Yeah, yeah. Everybody, <laughs> swimming's good for you. Yeah. But you'll appreciate, so I worked at CNN SI, so mm-hmm. I got a little bit, so I used to cut highlights for When games. did you leave CNN? I knew a lot. I used to go to, there a lot. So I was there sort of in the late 90s and okay. then went back to D.C. Gosh, you can challenge my thing. No, I just... 22, I, 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 used to, early I used to have friends that work. I still have friends that okay. work at CNN, so I used to go to some of their events and things, yeah. but not the 90s. I'm, well, then I went to, so in the 2000s, I went to, I moved to Manhattan okay. to work in sports. Okay. And I had the best job. I worked at foxsports.com and it was a heyday and I got to cover the South, which was a ton of fun. So mm-hmm. I just got to do whatever. Yeah. I taught myself HTML. That job... So young people don't remember that there was the dot bust, right? When everybody sort of laid people Mm -hmm. off. And Rupert Murdoch said, oh, I'm not going to make any money off this internet thing. 
I'm like, really? Fox Sports? Um, so I went to work at Madison Square Garden. That's crazy, because I had a buddy in the early 2000s that had an internship with ESPN, and all he did was key in the, the numbers. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just, you know, just update the, uh, update the games. Yeah. Like, that was his job. That was intern. the job. And now he's he's, he's doing phenomenal is things. He? Yeah. yeah. It is. Once you get in these places. So then I went to Madison Square Garden, literally worked under the floor of the garden. Wow. So when the big concerts would come in, the roof would sort of. I got to see Jordan come back. <laughs> Yeah. From the rafters of the garden. Wow. But I got to do a lot of ghostwriting. So I wrote for Marv Albert and Walt Clyde Frazier. Wow. That was pretty fun. That was pretty fly. Super cool. So that was very, very cool. Um, but then it was time to move to D.C. And I up and, and sort of moved to D.C. And went to, I went to back to CNN. And then I worked in a startup environment for a little while. And you know what? Honestly, after I joke, I worked for five crazy billionaires when I started to add them up. And so I said, I know more. And I begged PBS to take me. And, and I wanted wanted to do something that mattered. Mm-hmm. I wanted to do something that made a difference. And, you know, in your life, your career, when I mentor young people, different things matter to you at different points in your career. And I got to a point where I really wanted to do something that made a positive difference. And I was very lucky to get that job at PBS. You are, you are, you definitely are making a dis- d- difference. Where are you originally from? So the Jersey Shore. That's but right, I, Jersey yeah, Shore. Yeah, yeah. But I've, I lived all over as, as a kid. Got it. But uh, really the, the shore. Got it. <laughs> well, we like to we like to rapid fire toward okay. the end and okay. and ask random impulsive questions that okay. we don't think about. They just come from the gut. Okay. Have no idea what I'm gonna say typically. <laughs> okay. Uh, don't want you to put too much thought into it. It's just right. kind of quick. And then once that goes, you know, we'll we'll close. All right. So when you ride in the car, yeah. Okay. And uh, this is Jamie in the morning or Jamie after work. Okay. What are you typically listening to on the radio? Well, eighty eight point nine VPM news. Always. Pretty much always. Wow, because it's interesting. You know, I talk to a lot of artists, and yeah. I'll ask them that same question. Yeah, and they'll be like, like they'll say, "I never listen to music." Oh, you, you, what you mean you never listen to music? You're an artist. You yeah. make music all the time. I never listen to music. Really? Well, I'm a news junkie, so I, yeah. I have an addiction. So if I'm new- not listening, I will admit I'm a serious radio person, and I'm I love the '80s channel. I mean, I'm an '80s mm-hmm. rock girl. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, did you, you ever go into youth festivals? So I just came from a great, no, but Mm -hmm. I just, so my last three years I've been following 80s hair bands. Mm -hmm. So I just came from Nashville a few weeks ago where I saw Steve Miller, not, not rocker, but Steve Miller journey, you know, with the new singer and Def Leppard. You on Nashville? Yeah. It was amazing. Then you have to go to Bonnaroo. I have to go to Bonnaroo. Okay. I mean, I, I don't know, you, you're a family person, I imagine now. Well, no, it's just my husband and I and well, our, then y'all, and y'all our y'all baby. Need to go. Y'all definitely need to go. <laughs> we can go anywhere. Bonnaroo is the best music right. festival that you can go to. I love Seven it. days, no shower, just go out there and enjoy <laughs> life. I love that. <laughs> Do you go? Well, I used to go more, but now I have a 12-year-old. And so, Fair you enough. know, it's like I, I, when he grows up or we can go together. Yeah. I don't know. I, you see a lot of families out there with the kids, but it's... That'd be a lot. It's a little risky. That's it's a, a little risky. It's a lot. You, you, you're a different type of parent if you're comfortable. <laughs> like you can't block your kids from seeing everything. No, no. might be a, too young at twelve. It's a lot going on out there, but but it's right outside. You have to fly to Nashville to get to Bonnaroo. Okay. So check that out. Cool place though. Yeah. All right. Chicken or fish? Uh, fish. Grilled, baked. Blackened. Blackened. Okay. So you know, in 2024, post COVID, everyone was on some type of you know. They was vegan. They was vegetarian. Oh, they was no. All, so, so you still eating bacon? Yeah, 100%. You like pig. In fact, I went to South by Southwest one year okay. and went to a bacon-themed party. Yeah. One of the best parties I ever went to. I have a shirt <laughs> that says, I love bacon. And I won a pack of bacon. I won a pack of bacon. Yeah. I thought, I'm in Austin. What am I going to do with this pack of bacon? Yeah. But they had artists up and they were grilling bacon as part of their DJ act. It was crazy, but it was an experience. So you're, absolutely. Bacon. You're a fit person. I didn't know if you was jumped off the, you know. Oh, no. You know no I like to eat too much. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's interesting how the most fit people appear that they can That's eat whatever they I want. That's why I exercise. I like to enjoy the other things. <laughs> I got it. I got it. So, young Jamie, not that you're not young now, you obviously don't look a day Thank over you. 30. Thank you, Randy. Your mom taught you well. <laughs> yeah. But who was your celebrity childhood crush growing up? <laughs> uh, John Elway. I mean, John Elway. I can give you the quickest answer. Uh, really? Yeah, my, la- my first dog was named Elway. Okay. So, so you- I became a Broncos fan. That's going to be my next I'll question. I'll give you the very short. Yeah. So we lived in a bunch of different places when I was a mm-hmm. kid. My dad's from Pittsburgh, so I grew up watching the Steelers. Mm-hmm. 
Um, we lived in Cincinnati. My brother became a Bengals fan. My mom is from Kansas, so she's a Kansas City fan. So I needed my own team. I have family in Colorado, and it was about the year that Elway was drafted that I kind of became much more interested. But we were living in Atlanta at the time, and the Falcons were awful. Mm -hmm. But the Broncos were picked up all the time mm -hmm. on early cable, TNT, TBS. And so I just became a huge Broncos fan. And in fairness, I went through all the losses before they got to <laughs> So I'm not a fair weather. Yeah. And now they're awful so you know i'm hanging i'm hanging in but john elway uh, <laughs> i'm a basketball guy but i recently seen in the news uh he's a former bronco terrell something terrell davis terrell davis did you see what was the on running the, back yeah. no yeah he had a horrible experience oh no i saw that somebody took him off the plane yeah it was awful. horrible it was awful. crazy yeah it was crazy. Maybe. I don't know how they didn't know who Terrell Davis was. Yeah, so. I mean, I don't. He's even, a big I don't man. watch football, but I know who Terrell Davis yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right? He's an impressive character. Uh, are you a Richmonder or are you a Henrico? Richmonder. Yeah. Southside. Um, answer this the best way you can. Like, but in your role as a professional leading a media company, like, I would imagine, I, I, do you have to be careful on? political initiatives. Oh yeah. I don't do any, yeah, I don't weigh in on politics yeah. at all. I, and it's important because I want, mm -hmm. and actually we have, we have a policy at VPM mm -hmm. that our staff can't either. You really? won't see, you shouldn't see our staff walking around with political t-shirts. You won't come into our building and seeing any political, because when trust is waning, mm -hmm. we need to work very hard to earn the trust of the community every yeah. day. Yeah. And it's not fair if our reporter's going to interview a D or an R or whomever yeah. and feel like somebody at VPM is is misrepresenting. Yeah. So we we, we re respect our colleagues. We yeah. respect the community. So no. Yeah. I also think as a somebody who's been in journalism for a long time, I'm jaded on all things. So I just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um what is it about the city of I love your shoes by the way. Thank you. What is it about Richmond that 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 you love the most? Oh gosh, I I'd be here all day. So before I came here, mm -hmm. I lived in Atlanta, Manhattan and uh and DC. Big cities. Big cities. And I think a lot of people thought, "Oh, you w I love it here." I love You know what it is? I love the accessibility of everything. Whether you can go to a museum and park and walk in, what you can call anyone in this community and they'll talk to you. Mm -hmm. I think it's such a warm, accessible place, and certainly the breweries and the restaurants yeah. don't hurt. There's just hurt. and I love the river. I mean, yeah. there's just not anything not to like. I live on the south side and people thought, "Oh, I you'll never too. Jamie would never lead VPM downtown." I'm like, y'all, there's no traffic. Like you just drive here. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I'm so used to terrible commutes and terrible traffic. Yeah. Um, and I'm lucky to have a car and I'm able to do that. But I just find this whole community easy to navigate, accessible. And with all the things that a big city has, yeah. food, restaurants, arts, culture, music, I mean, yeah. it's all here in spades. And I yeah. think a really cool, diverse community as well. Yeah. Well, Jamie, it's been a pleasure having you on Thank the show. Thank you, Randy. Definitely I enjoyed it. the conversation. It's I'm been, glad we met. Yeah, I am too. And this is not going to be the last time. Hopefully. Because I'm definitely going to be frequenting your place. And, Good. Uh, Good. You'll you know, come and record at our new studio. Look forward to it. Look yeah. forward to promoting this show. And uh, appreciate all of you who tuned in. There's a lot of people who are probably tuning in for the first time listening to my show because of you. And uh, so I'm hopeful that we, you know, we made you guys happy, you know, and yeah. continue to watch the show. And uh, before we close, anything you'd like to say to our folks? No, thanks for thanks for listening. Thanks for your interest in VPM. Check out VPM.org if you want to learn more. Mm -hmm. And we'll certainly promote Randy in the podcast as well. Storytelling is so important for our community. And I'm glad to know what you're doing and to know you. And I'll pay a little bit more attention. You get some great guests on here. So I'm honored to be part of it. Thank you so much. This has been another episode of the Randy Wilson Podcast. Remember, podcasts can be played everywhere. Uh, but go over to randywilsonpodcast.com. We don't support our own platforms enough. A lot of times we're promoting everywhere else, Spotify, right. and Google, That's right. and YouTube. That's exactly right. But you know, right. we are paying for a domain. That's right. <laughs> so if you want to, you can go check out Jamie Swain over there. She is the CEO and president at VPM, and we are happy to have you have had you. Thank you again. Thank you.